Hi, I'm Dan Barker, and uh, you were just listening to Roy Zimmerman singing his song, Creation Science 101, which really sets up today's show, this week's episode of FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I'm the co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And it's Pi Day today. I'm Andrew Seidel, FFRF's Director of Strategic Response and a constitutional attorney here at FFRF. Pi Day is... Um, 314 for the number pi. Yeah, but only here, apparently. Only here in the U.S. <laughs> now, today we have a special guest with, guest with us in the Friendly Atheist Studio here at FFRF, Dr. Jerry Coyne. Jerry Coyne is a professor of biology. Uh, you've all read his books. He's known for his commentary on intelligent design. He's published dozens of papers elucidating the theory of evolution. He's currently a professor emeritus at the University of Chicago in the Department of Ecology and Evolution. Jerry's concentration is speciation and ecological and evolutionary genetics. Dr. Coyne is the author of the best-selling 2010 book, Why Evolution is True, and runs a popular website of that same name. He also wrote the book Faith vs. Fact, published in 2015. Dr. Coyne is a past recipient of FFRF's Emperor Has No Clothes Award and an honorary director at FFRF. Jerry, welcome to Ask an Atheist. Great to be here. Now, if you're in Madison, Wisconsin, come by Freethought Hall tonight for a discussion with Dan and Jerry and a book signing. Dan and I have some questions that we are going to ask Dr. Coyne. And if you'd like to ask a question, please do so in the comments below or send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org. And we might pose your question to Dr. Coyne. Now first, Jerry, this is Ask an Atheist, and you identify as an atheist, so can you tell us why? Well, as a scientist, I could answer in one word, which is evidence, or rather lack of evidence. Um, I didn't realize this. I had a, a road to Damascus moment when I became an atheist. <laughs> I can still remember it well. It's been documented. Uh, it was when the Beatles' um, Sgt. Pepper album came out. I think that was... <laughs> 67, but I can't remember for sure. Anyway, well, you, you were four years old, right? No, no, no. <laughs> I was about 16 or 17, uh -huh. and I was sitting on my parents' couch, nobody else's home. I put the album on for the first time, and of course, it was a, you know, an awakening for all of us who love music. And at one point, and I can't remember the song, but I still have the album, vinyl, of course. Um, I realized there was no God. It just came to me. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's the laws of physics that at that moment was determined that I would realize that there was no God. And I had realized then that everything that had been taught to me in my sort of secular Jewish upbringing, I had gone to synagogue and stuff, um, was wrong. And that I had been sold the bill of goods for my whole <laughs> life. And I hadn't really thought much about it. It wasn't religious, but, you know, it was... An awakening, and for about five minutes, I was sweating and shaking and thinking, "Oh my God, <laughs> after I die, I'm not going to go anywhere. That's it." And then somehow it passed, and I was fine. And ever since that moment, I've never looked back. Well, that just proves what I used to preach back then. I used to preach that if you listen to the godless worldly music, it will <laughs> it will destroy your faith. <laughs> so, so there you go. Yeah, I wish I remembered this song that was playing when I thought that. I mean, I would like to think it was A Day in the Life, the last song, but I really can't remember. But I do have the album. So If you could, if you could remember, we could blast it all over the country and, you know. Convert people. Convert people. Deconvert them. <laughs> uh, so um, you wrote uh, a couple of books, Why Evolution is True, uh, which some people say is the single best explanation of evolutionary theory, and Faith versus Fact, mm -hmm. uh, Why Science and Religion are Incompatible. And in the, I guess it's an epigraph, you quote Shelley, uh, Percy Bursch Shelley, who said, God is a hypothesis, and as such, stands in need of proof. The onus probandi, which is a fancy way to say burden of proof, uh, rests on the theist. So why did you open your book with that uh, Shelley quote? Well, it was to dispel the common notion that there is no overlap between science and religion. That's the most common argument for why they're compatible, because they deal with different realms. Shelley recognized this back in the 18th century, that they were not, that religion makes claims about fact, about the way the world is, and about what exists. And that's what puts it in conflict with science. And Shelley realized that And in that quote. He was a well-known atheist, of course, and was suffered because of it. I think he was expelled from either Oxford or Cambridge. He recognized that the idea of God is 
not something that can be proven true just by revelation, but you need evidence for it. And for such a strong hypothesis, you need strong evidence. As Hitchens said, extraordinary, or somebody said, extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence, and God is the most extraordinary claim. So, you know, my whole thesis is sort of encapsulated in that quote. That reminds me of a debate I did in San Diego where this young earth creationist opponent titled the debate, not does God exist, but does atheism make sense of reality? And I said, you're totally backwards. <laughs> We're not debating atheism. and We atheists don't have any burden of proof. We just don't have a belief. And so I made them change the title of the debate back to does God exist so that he would have the burden of proving it. And the rest of us, we, we have nothing to prove. Yeah, I mean, science, the business of science is to make sense of reality. Yeah. <laughs> the re idea of religion is to try to force reality into a Procrustean bed of pre-existing yeah. faith, so <laughs> that was a dumb title. Well, if the debate had been, does science make sense of reality, that would have been different. But he's, he was saying, does atheism, as if we have to, uh, as if we have a worldview that we have to justify. We're just not theistic. Yeah, they were putting the onus probandus on the atheist, as they yeah. always do, of yeah. course. Uh, now, burden of proof is something that I deal with as a lawyer quite a bit as well. Uh, and now when it comes to the law, or at least the First Amendment, you've been something of a secular activist. You've mm -hmm. helped FFRF stop a couple creationist teachers. Uh, you and I worked to expose NASA's multi-million dollar grant to the Center for Theological Inquiry. And you've actually read a few of my draft letters mm -hmm. to check my science for me. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about why you think separation of state and church is important? Well, for the same reason, I think that the Founding Fathers, and I know you have a book manuscript on this <laughs> issue, um, thought it was important because it allows the majority to tyrannize the minority religiously if you don't have this, and it allows the minority to be tyrannized. <laughs> so, you know, there is no rationale that I can see to allow religion, much less any form of superstition, to have a foothold in the way our nation is governed. I mean, I agree with Steve Pinker in his latest book, um, Enlightenment Now, that the way forward is through reason, and religion is the antithesis of reason. And um, the separation of church and state is the beginning of enforcing um, reason on the populace. So that's why I support it. Now, now one of the counter arguments that we often heard when you and I were Stopping, I think we stopped three creationist professors, if memory serves, a couple at Ball State and maybe one down in Georgia. Um, oh, yeah, I remember that one, yes. Yeah. Now, but one of the counter arguments that we always hear is um, academic freedom. And as an academic, I wonder if you could discuss kind of the conflict between academic freedom and... Yeah, well, academic freedom is misconstrued often as... I mean, it began as the right of a tenured professor or a professor to research whatever he or she wants to do. That is, your university could not tell you what to work on. And that freedom to follow your curiosity wherever it went was the, you know, the metier of the university, and it should be. Um, now, for some people, academic freedom means that professors can say whatever they want to their students in the class. And I don't agree with that. I mean, that's like saying that I could go into my class and teach them creationism and nobody could stop me. <laughs> well, they could stop me because A, I'm lying to my students, and B, it does not comport with the serious purpose of an academic class to, to teach that kind of stuff. So, you know, universities have every right to monitor what is said in the classroom. They, can't, they should not punish professors for occasionally interjecting a personal opinion. If they did that, then every professor <laughs> at the University of Chicago would be out. But they can enforce standards of academic rigor. So class. like a math professor couldn't spend the whole semester talking about fashion design or, or some other totally irrelevant topic. They have to stick to their discipline. Pretty much, and they, and, you know, they can't deliberately distort it, which was yeah. the problem at Ball State when Eric Hayden was teaching a class in intelligent design which was supposed to be a science class. Yes. <laughs> and he was telling the students or making them read stuff which simply was unscientific. And um, the creationists cried, you know, First, First Amendment, you know, academic freedom, he could teach what he wants. But in reality, he was distorting and lying to the students and eventually the, prof the head of the university stopped this nonsense. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that was Joanne Gora. She really Joanne Gora, she's gone now, unfortunately, but they still don't teach. Um, intelligent design in 
any public university that I know about. So. Andrew said that when he was sending his letters to these institutions, he asked you to check his science. Was his science any good? I mean, did you? <laughs> yeah, as I recall, I didn't have to make many. Oh, really? And one good thing about the FFRF is it's science friendly and they don't uh. screw up very much. I mean, I just saw the life size statue of Darwin in the library, <laughs> which was very pleasing <laughs> to me. So there's a very close connection between atheism and science because they both rely on reason and evidence. And um, so, as I recall, Andrew didn't require much. So, you. You, you're a professional trained biologist, scientist, right? That's your field. You, you yes. work with the fruit flies, the Drosophila. Yes. Drosophila. Drosophila. Right. Yeah, the fruit flies for years. You were one of the leading researchers in that. And for a while, you were the researcher. Is that right? Well, not. I mean, there's a gazillion people working on Drosophila, uh, um, all the way from molecular biology to ecology. Um, I can say that, I, you know, I got a lot of people interested in using fruit flies to study the origin of species. So that's my area of Because interest. of the short generation, right? Yeah, so you, if you're interested in the genetics of different species, how one species turns into two, then you can get a lot of information by crossing those two species together, uh -huh. which you can do in flies. And because a generation only takes 12 days to two weeks, you can get a lot of genetic information very so, quickly. So you, you really focus on biology then why are you writing about religion? Is that, how does religion fit into your work with biology? Well, it's because I was working in the one area, or maybe two areas, cosmology being the other, in which science directly hits religion in the solar plexus, uh -huh. <laughs> evolution and cosmology. I mean, they both counteract the Genesis account of creation. And not only that, but there's a lot of reasons why thinking that we evolved from other creatures that aren't like us makes people queasy. <laughs> There's no, I mean, chemistry doesn't do that. You know, most physics doesn't do that. Nobody gets upset by the theory of relativity, but they do by evolution. And for my whole professional career, I had to fight people, including with some of my students who would, you know, um, reject what I was trying to tell them. And when this first book came out, Why Evolution is True, even the title was attacked. I mean, my, even my publishers <laughs> were wary of the title because they said, well, maybe it is true, but do you have to be so much in your face about it? And I said, no, it's just as true as, you know, um, any good scientific theory like the germ theory of disease or atoms. So, you know, even at that time, I was facing a little bit of queasiness about blatantly asserting the truth of evolution. And after I taught it for 30 years and faced all this pushback, in Maryland, I used to teach it, and there was a preacher right underneath my classroom in the quad waving his Bible and saying how evolution was the tool of the devil. And so very quickly, I got interested in the question of why religious people simply cannot accept the truth of evolution. I mean, if they're liberal religious people, they should be able to accept the truth of evolution and comport it somehow with their religious beliefs. After all, there's a lot of things in the Bible that we know are wrong that liberal religious people have Accept it, you know. <laughs> but mm -hmm. evolution still, I mean, Catholic Church is widely said to have accepted evolution, yeah, be yeah. down with evolution. But if you look at the data, 27% of American Catholics are young earth creationists. Catholics? Yeah, yeah. so they're going yeah. against their well, church's dogma. And the reason, I think, is that what I said, that there's simply something about the nature of evolutionary biology. And Steve Stewart Williams wrote a whole book on this, which is well worth reading lists all the reasons why evolution makes people uncomfortable. It's materialistic. It seems to deny the existence of any objective morality. It says that, you know, we're not special in the scheme of things. <laughs> I think that's the big one. Yeah, in fact, morality and the lack of human exceptionalism are the two biggest reasons. Well, what about the Bible? It, the, it contradicts the Bible, too. As well. Yeah, but I think, you know, most Americans, except for evangelicals, would not necessarily say that the Bible is literally true. The latest Gallup poll shows that 40% of Americans are young earth creationists. Yeah. So that leaves six and 10 open to some either fully materialistic view of evolution or some met metaphorical interpretation that allows or for evolution. Or theistic evolution, that, uh, that God used evolution as his tool to create life yeah, or something. Yeah, I have uh, strong objections to that. In fact, yeah. there are almost twice as many theistic evolutionists as there are straight naturalistic evolutionists. So the yeah. statistics are 40% young earth creationists, about 34% theistic evolutionists, and only 19% naturalistic evolutionists in America. Uh, uh, well. 
a moment ago you used the word theory, talking about the sciences. Some viewers might say, aha, you use the word theory. You're admitting <laughs> that evolution is not actually true. It's a theory. Yeah. Well, that comes from a misunderstanding of the word theory, which is meant to be an explanatory schema that manages to make sense of a lot of phenomena. So we speak of the germ theory of disease, and we still do. <laughs> that disease is like, you know, smallpox and um, cholera are caused by microorganisms that you can't see. Now everybody knows that's true, except for the very few deniers of, you know, the germ of the fact that this is the case. And we speak of the atomic theory, that the smallest chemically um, identifiable bit of an element is an atom. You know, those yeah. are theories too. But you don't see people saying, "Well, atoms are just a theory," or no, "Atoms don't exist." Yeah, yeah. and yeah. yet they'll say that about evolution. It's just a semantic argument against evolution based on a misunderstanding of the word theory. It's something we actually have to include in our legal letters all the time. And I think you helped me craft some of that language in the beginning. Yeah. <coughs> um, you know, the only way around this is to educate the public what theory means. But yep. unfortunately, creationists, as you must know well, are willfully misunderstand this stuff. You could tell them till you're blue in the face, this is what a theory means. And they still are going to go back to this time-worn argument that Reagan started in 1980. It's a th only a theory. And so the, equating theory with wild hypothesis. Well, the, the phrase I use is... Uh, as a musician, I use the word music theory. Yes. If I had, if I say music theory, am I suggesting there's exist. no such thing as music? <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. So that's one of the many, many arguments against evolution. Yeah. Well, so we have a question from online from Lane Taylor, which is, what is the craziest anti-evolution argument that you've ever heard? Well, there's two ways to interpret that. <laughs> um, crazy in terms of being just, you know, insane and offensive to any rational person. And there's crazy in that it flies in the face of so much known evidence that you'd be foolish to accept it. The first one I would say is um, that Satan put the fossils in the earth to fool people. Mm, yes. I mean, that's yes. just an insane argument <laughs> because, you know, well, it presumes that Satan is cleverer than God, which I don't know if the Bible implies that, but also that, you know, not just that the fossils are in the ground are fools, but the dates have been adjusted, the rate of radiometric decay has been adjusted, the order in which the fossils appear have been adjusted. I have a t-shirt at home which says, you know, teach the controversy, and it shows Satan with horns burying oh, yeah. dinosaur <laughs> skeletons <laughs> in the ground. So that's pretty crazy. The craziest sort of normal assertion, which is the one that's most easily refuted by evidence, is that there are no transitional fossils between humans and our ape-like ancestors. Um, that all these Neanderthals and Homo erectus and Australopithecines are just creatures that are, were affected with rickets. And that's where they were bent over <laughs> and stuff. And that's just refuted by the fact that, well, the simple fact that every human ancestor must have had rickets. <laughs> you know? But also if you line up the human fossils in order from four million years ago to today, you see this progression, and it's not in how you're bent over, it's the size of the skull, the size of the teeth, um, the configuration of your bones so that we became more and more upright. In fact, I was on a uh, BBC show where we carted a bunch of creationists from England around the U.S. and tried to convince them that evolution was true, and I went out on Lake Havusu, I think, in the Grand Canyon, and tried to convince them that the ark story was wrong. They didn't buy it. The one thing that the creationists could not deal with was going to Berkeley and have seeing all Donald, I think it was Donald Johansson, line up all the human skulls in order of time from Australopithecus today and say, well, look at this. What do you make of this? And well, they had no answer. They could not demarcate a line that separated, you know, the ape forms from the human forms. And they, at that point, some of them began coming around. You know what happened to me when I was a preacher? I used to misunderstand evolution. And I think that's the problem. I would have been thinking back then, how could I have evolved from my cousin? How could, how could my cousin become me? When actually it's not your cousin, it's your ancestors yeah, your that ancestors. you come from. Instead of thinking this way, if you think this way, you see that we, there are these links in this progression coming through. And I had to make a flip in my mind to actually understand what evolution was actually saying, rather than what I thought it was saying. But. Yeah, having, you know, taught it all my life, to me it seems so obvious, but um, to many people, just beginning the study of evolution, these things 
do cause problems. And one of them is the one you said, you know, the f the classical quote is, you know, if we evolved from apes, how come they're still <laughs> apes? Yeah. You know? And then you have to explain, and Richard Dawkins has done this very well, how you start with a common ancestor and then it branches off into yeah. all living creatures. So. Yeah, well, uh, if uh, Protestantism came from Catholicism, why are there still Catholics? That's right. <laughs> you know? That's right. Or if humans came from dust, you could ask the religious, why is there still dust? Still dust, yeah. <laughs> That's right. So I have a question for you. You mentioned our Darwin statue in the library. Other than Darwin, who would you say is your favorite scientist? Oh, Lord. I mean, there's so many of them. Um, I w you know... It depends on whether, by favorite whether you mean, you know, most accomplished scientists that you most respect for their accomplishments or somebody that you just like as a human being. Well, you can give multiple answers. Whatever yeah, you well, you know, Newton is classically where there with Darwin is somebody who, you know, reformed the human mind or Galileo. Um, Newton I have trouble liking a lot because he was religious <laughs> and he spent a lot of his time doing alchemy. So, but I would certainly put him up there in the panoply and as well as Einstein. Um, he created a revolution in human thought and unfortunately was unable to capitalize that. As he got older and older and older, he clung to versions of physics. Like he wouldn't accept quantum mechanics fully and stuff. But, you know, in terms of revolutionizing the way we look at the universe, it would be Darwin and Newton and Galileo and Einstein, I think. so. And not Dwayne Gish or Michael <laughs> Behe or uh, no. some of these I mean, young Earth creationist types. Yeah, I, I keep thinking that about 20 years ago, the intelligent design movement said that by this time, within 20, 25 years, scientists will have accepted intelligent design. We've turned the corner, they said, and, um, and the evidence for intelligent design is right around the corner. And this was, you know, 20 years ago, and it was going to come out five years after that. Well, here we still are. They haven't produced anything, and yet they're still with us. So but Believers always talk like that. I used to preach the second coming of Jesus is just a month or so. It's just coming right away. I, back in the 60s, I was saying that, you know. And, um, and they've been saying it for millennia. And Hal Lindsey, who wrote that late Great Planet Earth book, if you remember that, he yeah. said the second coming of Christ could not possibly be any later than the mid-1980s, he said, you know. And we were all, yeah, yeah, there's something in the mind that you think this corner is going to be turned and the scientific world is going to be humbled and they know something that we don't. Well, even the Bible, Jesus says that, you know, the Son of Man is going to come into his kingdom before some of the listeners yeah. to <laughs> Jesus died. Well, that should have been the first clue that, you know, these people just have yeah. one reason after another to put it off. So it's interesting. That's very similar to the way the idea and creationists keep telling us that, yes, we're going to come up with the evidence yeah. very soon, and it never <laughs> appears, and yet they still hold on to their belief. Yeah. Huh. So we have another question from online from Rachel Gran. Um, she says she's a big fan. She's wondering, how would you counter the creationist claim that the Earth is only around 6,000 years old and that that thereby proves evolution false? Yeah, well... <clears throat> I mean, dating is the way to do it, radiometric dating. Um, you know, you can Google that or you can suggest to her that she do that. There's lots of good websites that show how the Earth is dated. Um, it's the rate of radiometric decay of elements. And, you know, the creationists will say, well, that could have changed over time. You know, it could have sped up and therefore the Earth looks younger than it really is. Or, so, um, but we have ways of cross-checking that, which are too complicated for me to explain on this kind of show. But you can use like three or four different elements that have different decay rates to date the oldest rocks. And they have to be igneous rocks. And um, they all give a coincident date. So we have ways of cross-checking how old the Earth is. And it's about 4.6 billion years old. And all the other, we can put it to within like, a couple hundred thousand years now. So, you know, that's an irrefutable but even within mind. history even within the last 10,000 years of history or whatever we knew for example that my native american ancestors were on this continent 12 to 15,000 yeah, years correct. ago which mean which was what 5,000 years before the world was created they were already here and even i think even most young earth creationists realize yeah we have history that goes back beyond that point. Yeah, well they could all, I mean, I don't know where this 10,000 years comes from unless it's Bishop Usher, but yeah. that was 6,000 years, yeah. 4,004 BC, so, you know, um, by clinging to that young earth date, they're really eroding their credibility severely. Um, yeah. Well, they're also missing out on such an, a much better 
more grand view of the universe. You know, there's a spot in the Grand Canyon where you can hold your hand over two layers of rock and you span a billion years of the Earth's existence. You used to be a guide at the Grand Canyon. Yeah, right? I did that when I was a Grand Canyon tour guide, yeah. And just to, to, to be able to do that and then think, well, it's only 6,000 years old, it's just the, the two views are, it's, this view is so much more grand. Uh, well, yeah. to, That's to, a good to us word, it grand. is. To them, they'd say, <laughs> well, the view of a omnipotent, omniscient God, and the fact that we're going to meet our grandfather in heaven is a grander view of life, you know. Unfortunately, yeah. there's no evidence for it. So. <laughs> So we have another question that says, it's kind of similar along those lines. Um, some, sign, some say that science can't deal with myths, that it can't combat the inane biblical claims like Moses started humanity in the middle of the Neolithic. Can't we just use science to prove that the Bible is false? You actually just used the Bible a minute ago to prove that the Bible yeah. is false. But well, of course uh, we can for many things. I mean, we can refute the claims that Ba the biblically based claims that the earth is 6,000 years old. We can refute the claim that there was an exodus f of Jews from Egypt. We can refute the Genesis 1 and 2 stories, of course, that the, you know, this is the order of creation and things happen instantaneously. Um, there are some things in the Bible that are true, some of the historical figures that are adduced. Dan, you would know this better than I do. But well, Methuselah supposedly lived... 969 years. Which means he lived for one-sixth of the entire history of the human, <laughs> right. human race. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so the Bible is a mixture of statements that are literally true. I mean, there was Pontius Pilate. He existed. And that are false, like the Exodus and like um, the census of Caesar Augustus, which, as far as I know, never took place. And there are things that are, in principle, refutable, like Jesus rose from the dead, or Jesus existed. I mean, I, I think we have no evidence that Jesus existed as a real human being that even was a preacher. So, yeah, as far as I know, the major claims of the Bible are, are the, the testable claims that are refutable have been refuted. <coughs> the few claims that are true have been buttressed and the claims there are claims that are irrefutable like there is a god mm -hmm. you know as an atheist i can't say i know there is no god i can just say there's strong evidence against it but if you say well there's some deity up there that created the laws of physics and set the earth in motion that's not what the bible says though. <laughs> <laughs> so you know but if that's a religious claim that's one that is impossible to refute well that's why your book is titled faith versus, versus fact right you can have your faith if you want, to believe whatever you want, but it's not the same as fact. No. And so you say the two are incompatible. Yes. And, I mean, my thesis is, there are lots of ways that people try to make them compatible. Steve Gould's thesis that religion deals with meaning, morals, and values, and science deals with the truth about the universe is the most common way that people try to reconcile science and religion, yeah. that they're non-overlapping magisteria. But the first people to refute that claim were the theologians who said, no, no, wait a minute. We don't just deal with meaning, morals, and values. We make factual assertions because if Jesus didn't live, if he wasn't resurrected, if there is no heaven, then our religion is meaningless. And in Hebrews 1, I think it says that. I can show off some of my knowledge of the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if, if, there be no, if Jesus be not resurrected, then your faith is not true. So, yeah, well, you know, that, that, that was Paul in one of the epistles, yeah. Okay, so, right. okay, screw but that. Was close. <laughs> Hebrews talks about faith, but yeah. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry, you're right. It's Hebrews 111, I think. Yeah. I have to recoup my knowledge of the... <laughs> no, yeah, so. don't waste your time. <laughs> yeah. There's better things to read. Than <laughs> yeah, well, to establish credibility with the religious, you have to show that you've known it. And I spent, like, a long time reading the King James Version of the Bible when I wrote this. Uh -huh. It was one of the most tedious mind-numbing exercises I'd ever done. Unlike Richard Dawkins' claim that the Bible is a great work of literature, I didn't find that to be true at all. There are bits of it that are nice, but by and large, it's a long, tedious disquisition on <laughs> who begat who, and this is the way you're supposed to build the ark, and you know, you kill somebody if they um, are picking up sticks on the Sabbath. I didn't find that to be great literature. And I would maintain that if there was one copy of the Bible that existed and somebody found it in a bookstore in Bloomsbury and they picked it up and read it, they would not think it was a great work of literature. They'd say, oh, this is just the ravings of some lunatic, yeah. you know, and throw it away. Well, but, I know people who read the Bible and then became atheists. The Bible was the reason why they gave up their faith. Because it's so nasty. Yeah. And, yeah. Oh, well, for you. 
Well, they also say that seminaries are the great generators <laughs> of atheists too, but I wouldn't know about that. So, mm. so I do want to say, you write about the historical existence of Jesus, that there's no good evidence. There is evidence. I mean, well, the, gospels, the, the gospels are evidence, but it's not good evidence. And so it lowers the probability that he existed, not to zero, but it's very low. Well, then would you say that the existence of the, the books about Paul Bunyan is, constitutes evidence <laughs> that there was a giant it's, blue it's, ox? It's bad evidence. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's evidence, but it's bad evidence. Well, right. yeah, I mean, it, it to my mind, it's just evidence that we don't even have to take seriously. Yeah. I mean, the fact that scriptures say that Jesus existed, I would take more seriously if there was some extra biblical evidence for a Jesus person. And I know that, I mean, this is, this is, Put you in bad odor with theologians if you deny that there's really strong evidence for a Jesus person, but that seems to be the fact. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, for Jesus to be the Son of God and our Savior, he has to have existed in the first place. So if you say, well, there's not much evidence, right off the bat, they just start yeah. attacking yeah, you. Yeah, that's that. important. So we have a couple of good questions from online. Sam asked via email, uh, he said, creationists always say that evolution can't be observed. Is that true? Oh, no, not at all. I mean, in my book, this book, I give 300 examples. I mean, I list a book that gives 300 examples of evolution in action. So, yes, we can see evolution in time. Now, granted, we cannot see a, in a human time, in a generation, we cannot see a reptile evolving into a bird or a mammal. But we can see evolution on a, a scale that is so fast that if extrapolated over millions of years, it could have produced that. Plus, we have the fossils that show this transformation happening. And I always wonder why people demand to see things in real time <laughs> in order to accept that. I mean, that's like saying that because we weren't there when George Washington lived, that he didn't exist. So we can question record all of recorded history because of that. So the answer is yes, we do see lots of evidence of evolution in real time. and. And there's more every day in the journals. But second of all, you know, you don't have to see that. Darwin didn't have any evidence for that, and yet the origin of species was convincing to almost every reasonable person. Like in if his you're day. walking through a forest and you see these young saplings and these young trees and these mature trees, you don't have to stand there and wait for 200 years to know what's happening to one of those trees. You can yeah. observe all the different stages of their development, and you can see how that tree grows without having to actually observe it in real time. Yeah, although you could, why should get bigger? Well, yeah. Cosmology is another one. The evolution of stars has been well worked yeah. out, but we rarely see anything happening like yeah. that. The, the fact that historical evidence does not count as evidence for these people <coughs> is, shows that there's some mental problem they have with understanding what evidence really is. Well, that's one of Ken Ham's favorite rejoinders is, were you, were you there? Yeah. Right? Have, you, have you actually, have you visited the Ark Park? His, no, his I, I want to go, but I can't see myself paying thirty dollars to it's put into hand. Can, can well, it's it's forty two now, and yeah. then ten dollars for parking. You don't have to because yeah. Andrew went, and there's a video of Andrew there. Yeah, I think I saw things. part of that. It's actually. really not worthwhile. Yeah. There's, it's really bad. Uh, yeah. I, I do not recommend it. Um, I haven't been to the Creation Museum either, but for the same reason, I don't want to enrich creationists. But I kind of like to go. I don't know if I could withhold all my groans and <laughs> uh, expletives if I went, however. No, so. you shouldn't. <laughs> well, I think there's guards there to keep people like me out. From groaning? <laughs> well, yeah, or if you have any negative reaction publicly to the exhibits, I think they heave you out. So, uh, so talking about evolution in real time, uh, the grants on the Galapagos, their book, The Beak of the Finch, mm -hmm. uh, I found that amazing, because how many decades have they been there observing during drought, how the beaks get bigger, and then during the wetter season, how they get smaller. And this, you can actually see changes within, I don't know if that's a, one species to another, but you can actually see physical evolutionary changes in real time. Yeah, in fact, that, uh, that experiment where the, there was a drought and the seeds got bigger because the small plants died was just one year, 1976. Well. And, and they, they documented the whole thing. This is the best example of evolution in real time we have, I think, because we know what happened exactly, and we know the genetic basis for it. And what happened was the finches with the small beaks literally died because they could not eat the big seeds. Crack open them, yeah. And you could find the corpses of the finches, <laughs> and you could see who reproduced and who left offspring, and it was the one with the bigger beaks. And in fact, in one generation, the beak size went 
one year, the beak size went up 10%. Huh. And that is a far faster rate of evolution than we see in the fossil record. Of course, they so, would say that's microevolution. Well, yeah, because if you want to see macroevolution in real time, hard to do, but you just go to the fossils and there it yeah. is. So, so we, ha we have another question uh, that Corey Melton asks, which is, what can I do as a scientifically literate layperson to most effectively usher my science-denying, Bible-believing friends and family into an understanding of science? Well, that's a hard question. It's one I'm often asked. If they're, you first have to ascertain whether these are the kind of religious people whose minds are open. And that eliminates a huge swath <laughs> of people, especially those who deny evolution, because the evidence for evolution is everywhere in the, you know, Sagan, Dawkins, Dennett, Gould, you know, everybody gives the evidence for evolution. So, you know, you, you have to find out before you waste your breath whether or not they are open-minded. And then, if they're open-minded, I would just give them, I mean, I hate to be self-promoting, but <laughs> I'd give them that book and say, okay, look, I'm not going to argue with you. Read this book and then get back to me. Or actually, well, give them both the books probably huh. would be better. Yeah, although, I mean, I would, <laughs> this book doesn't say anything about religion except for one statement that I would probably take back if I were to um, write it again, which is that liberal religions have always found a way to accommodate evolution. But that's a tautology because what I meant by liberal religions are those religions <laughs> that recommended evolution. Yeah, so, um, so I probably should have just left religion out of that book entirely. I just say, re look, the facts are here. They're also online everywhere. Read this book and um, get back to me if you have any issues. I don't think debating the way that Ken Ham debated Bell Nye is the way to settle the issue because it's an exercise in rhetoric. You only have like an hour to change, you know, change your mind, and that's not the way people change their minds. So. Uh -huh. Well, it does give an audience exposure to the fact that there is an articulate point of view that's different from them, like especially at a college, when those students are really kind of in the middle, they're j leaving home for the first time, and they'll see someone like you up there articulating this. It can go a long way towards influencing. Yeah, that's one argument. But the other side of that is that it gives, by a scientist debating a creationist, it gives a creationist credibility yeah. because here we have a respected evolutionary biologist taking seriously the arguments of creation so maybe there's something to them well all. let the students decide who yeah they th who but they I think, think the way they should decide is not through debate but by reading yeah. and thinking and stuff it's not a quick process it's not mm -hmm. something that happens in an hour so you know if you can read my book or lots of other books Richard Dawkins has one on the evidence for evolution and find a way around that evidence then you know, you know, but in, in Richard Dawkins' <laughs> book, he starts off by saying he really didn't have to write it because you had already written this. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, we, yeah. Had, we had it in mind at the same time. <laughs> yeah. I was really scared when I heard Richard was writing <laughs> this book because he's so much more well-known than I am and a much better writer. I thought, well, I'm screwed. But <laughs> it turned out that the books, they are overlap, not overlapping magisterial. They largely deal with different yeah. topics, although the, the main point is the same. And so they both sold pretty well independently. So I had one more kind of question I wanted to, it's sort of the reverse of what you were just saying about a scientist debating a creationist and legitimizing that. There are some scientists who are young earth creationists and who are, at, or maybe not young, but creationists. Um, you know, how do you think that affects the scientific field and do you have a nice sense of sort of what the demographics are among scientists? Oh, atheists? scientists are atheists by and large. Um, I have the statistics are in this book. Um, and the higher you go up in the scientific hierarchy in terms of accomplishment, the more atheistic they become. So on average, I think something like uh, 40 to 50 percent of the average American scientists are atheists or non-believers. That contrasts with probably like 5 to 10 percent of Americans being atheists. Mm -hmm. If you look at scientists at elite universities, and these are not defined by me, but by Elaine Eklund, a sociologist at Rice, at scientists who work at really good universities, about 65% of them are atheists. Yeah. And if you look at the National Academy of Scientists, which elects the really highly qualified, accomplished scientists, 97% of them are atheists. It's almost the exact reverse of the American public as a whole. Well, we're out of time here, Jerry. Okay. Uh, but people who live in Madison, in Dane County area, can come tonight to Freethought Hall and hear you give a talk about more of the same issues. Uh, what time is that thing? Um, it's at 7, 7, 7 p.m. tonight. 7 p.m. tonight here in Madison in, in this building here at Freethought Hall. Oh, there's the flyer up there on the screen. 
So, uh, well, thank you, Jerry. Thanks for giving your time, for coming all the way up here from Chicago, from deep south Chicago, <laughs> for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having yeah. me. And that's going to do it for this episode of Ask an Atheist. So, again, remember, if you're in Madison, come by tonight, uh, where Dan and Jerry are going to have another great conversation. And, Jerry, you're going to be signing books, too, I believe. Yep. They'll be available for sale. Um, and join us next week at noon central time for another episode of FFRF's Ask an Atheist.